Let's talk about, well, you know, the, the different ways of getting there, because, um, you know, when when I hear like, oh, you, you're getting, you know, you as a patient go out and, you, and I as an insurance company is going to tell you you're going to get 43 grand. Go out and find a hospital that, um, you know, you, you will cost you 43 grand to do this or you're going to pay more. And that's, you know, um, it would be completely unreasonable if it was for a heart attack, right? Like, I mean, obviously, right. I don't have the time to shop uh, around. Right. But even even when I do have time to shop around, right? Like, isn't that a cost that's associated with, like, I have to go and spend my time uh, yep. finding, like, a good place? Like, it's one thing, you know, if I want to go buy a TV, or, you know, and even now it's pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, I want to get a good deal on a TV. Uh, it's, it's worth it for me. But... For healthcare, like, should I really have to have that kind of savvy and uh, expend that type of energy to get the best price for uh, for my hip replacement? Well, the simple answer is, of course not. You know, this is a terrible burden to put on patients who are sick. Um, but in our current system, I don't think it. You know, it should be our endpoint. But in our current system. It's important to do partly um, because it will save you money and partly because it sends signals to the providers that we're not going to take this anymore. Now, and the companies that do this and do it well will say, here are all the hospitals in our state that will do it for this amount and um, will compile a list to make it easy. And I think companies have been a bit asleep at the wheel in helping their employees uh, so-called shop for health care. Um, ultimately, I do think uh, we shouldn't have to shop for health care personally, that I think, you know, um, that's a terrible position to put patients who are ill in, particularly if they have a, a more acute illness. Now, you can argue a, a knee replacement or a hip replacement. People do have the time to shop around. They often do call a bunch of different surgeons and hospitals. Um, and if your uh, your employer says, here are all the ones that will do it for $43,000, you can. it's not that hard to do. So, all right, so what kind of, what, what kind of system should we go to that would be uh, more efficient? Because there's obviously a big problem with cost controls here. And yeah. so um, what are the different models where you could get cost controls that would be durable, that would be A, right. effective, and, and B, durable. Right. Um, I, I think, you know, the one thing you can say is we have no way to control costs and prices in our system. And different countries, I'm a journalist, I, it's a political decision what we choose, but I think if you look around the world, countries either do something like a single-payer system where you get a big bargaining power because you have a single payer who can say, eh, that drug's not worth it, that the price you're charging us for that hospital stay is not worth it. Um, so that works. And by the way, single payer systems, some of them do maintain a private insurance market for people who want to pay for more or for more amenities. Um, you could also go to what countries like Switzerland and Germany have done, which is to, and Belgium, to have uh, price setting, price regulation. Um, you either say this is what uh, this procedure or this implant is worth and this is what we'll pay or you say here's the ceiling the maximum and you can compete under it so there there are other ways to do it um, but we do none of the above and of course we're not even really thinking of any of the above except in the plans where people are talking about maybe allowing medicare to negotiate drug prices that would be a start of moving in that direction. But I will note that all of the kind of fixes we're talking about in the ACA, um, none of those really address the pricing issue. What right. they do is they try and insulate patients from the cost, but that's really hard to do until you head on face the fact that we pay you know, between two and ten times as much for the exact same things, medical encounters, as people do in the rest of the world. So, all right. So, let me ask you this. I mean, because and I and I'm I'm sensitive to the fact that you don't want to make a um, you know you don't want to you don't <laughs> I want have to quit if I if I've made it if I said this is what I think we should do. <laughs> well, right. No, that's fine. And I and I and I respect that as a, as a reporter uh, that makes some sense. But in terms of the types of countries 
that are able to have a price control regime versus the type, the, the, the nature of the societies that have a single payer, right? Like, because, um, you know, the, it, what culturally speaking, one may be easier to implement than another right. in different cultures, right? And um, right. I mean, we certainly, and, and going from the type of system that we have to a regime of price controls, because one of the problems that we have in this country, it seems to me, is that we don't even have an apparatus to have a federal price control system, do we? I mean, because it's, it's so fragmented. Well, we do a version of it for electricity, for example. You know, you could you could regulate health prices as you would a, a, um, a utility. I don't think we'll go there personally, but what I say in the book is that we will find a system or we need to find a system that respects our cultural preferences, our medical system as it exists today, um, and and our, our kind of you know, whatever is our kind of funky American bias about independence and choice and individualism. But, um, you know, I don't think we're that exceptional from the rest of the world when it comes to health care. People want health care. They need health care. They need insurance. This narrative of, you know, we respect individualism. and If someone doesn't want to buy insurance, they shouldn't have to. Um, I'm out around the country speaking about this stuff all the time. And I can tell you, people want health insurance. Insurance, they just can't afford it in this country. You know, they 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 add up the the eight hundred dollars a month premium, and then the deductibles and the copayments and the out of network charges, and it adds up to you know twenty twenty five percent of their family's disposable income, and they make a choice to say you know. I'd rather be able to send my kid to college. And so I think we need to take that barrier away. And I do think, you know, we'll develop a system that that respects all of our preferences. But now, you know, we like choice, but, hey, the one we choose is not in our network. And we don't really get to choose anyway. Right. Well, I was going to say, like, what do we mean by when we want choice, right? Like, because, like, <laughs> how does – how? let me ask you this. How would – Price controls um, and versus a single payer. Would there be a difference in those two scenarios as to uh, where, you know choice being limited? Well, with price controls, you know, Germany, for example, has hundreds of insurers. I would note they're they're all non not for profit, really not for profit, um, and. Uh, so you you have your choice there, right? Well, you, you, you have your choice of insurers. You have your choice of insurers. But I'm saying, really, nobody cares but about have- like choosing insurance as much as they want to choose what doctor they see, right? Right. But but if you're Right, but but in the German system, for example, all the doctors participate in all the plans. So you can go see what doctor. I mean, we have this notion that if you go to a single payer or a more regulated system, you won't be able to make those choices. You can. Of course you can. What What is somewhat different is there is a sense of, particularly in a single payer system, you may have to wait longer, right? If it's a non-urgent uh, issue, you may have to wait longer. Now, what I will tell people when they say that is, oh, I don't want to have to wait. I'll say like, yeah, try and find mental health care in New York City. Your wait will be infinite right. if you want to go in right. network. We have waits here. We just don't acknowledge them. And I think so there's a lot of fear mongering that goes on around, uh, you know, a price controlled system, both in the medical community and in the patient community. Uh, a lot of b- even bigger fear mongering that goes into what would happen in a single payer system. Um, there will be differences. There will be certain kinds of of weights, but generally in terms of physici- physician choice, which is what we tend to focus on, um, there's a lot of choice um, and, and probably more than you have in the average narrow network plan in the U.S. now. Right. A so single payer, I, think- I would assume, right? Like everybody, I mean, even if you had, uh, r- 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 you know, you, you had doctors working outside of that system, ultimately there would be more people available to uh, most people under a single pair, uh, most uh, more doctors would be available under a single pair, right? To most people. Right. I think the ch- doctors, you would have more choice. There might be certain kinds of treatment that in a single payer system, they decided were not 
had not been scientifically proven to a point that they were willing to pay for it. Right. So there would be places around the edges where you might get uh, a certain kind of advanced care quicker in the U.S. Now, the caveat to that is it's not necessarily better care because in the U.S. you can sell things that sound good that haven't been proven right. as much. Right. Um, all right. So let me ask you this. Um, uh, also, uh, uh, you know, from a from a purely like a you know a rep- reportorial perspective, we're talking about two different regimes here. One is a uh, a price co- control regime, uh, maintaining I guess a bunch of uh, you know insurance companies. Although the example of that is where they're all nonprofit, and I don't know that we actually have real nonprofit or that many in this country. But presuming no, we, we don't. presuming we could get there, and then the other hand, we have a single payer which provides the cost controls because you have a single payer who is, uh, instead of, you know, I mean, theoretically, there's a certain redundancy between those two uh, plans, right? Because you would have to set up some type of governmental agency that makes the assessment of what each procedure is worth, right, to, right. to make it uniform. So what of this opt-in to a single-payer type of system or opt-in to Medicare? Because that, to me, seems— yeah. Well, well, let me ask you this. That to me seems like it would be incredibly inefficient because you wouldn't get the benefit of price controls for at least a large percentage of of the care. And to the extent that you get price controls in the system that people opt into, a lot of it seems to me, you know, hospitals would 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 jump out of that system because they want to be in the sort of more Wild West system. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, first of all, no no hospital can opt out of Medicare because they get Medicare dollars for doctor training. You you can't survive as a hospital without Medicare. So I think that opt out is not is not going to happen. Um, and, but I would like to point out you can also have price controls with private for profit insurers too, um, where you just peg price controls to Medicare rates. You say we're going to pay two hundred percent of Medicare. And, and insurers can decide if they can accept that or not. Um, but I think that that is a third option and maybe the one we'll, we'll go to. But in terms of the opt-in to a, a public, what, what's called a public option, either opting into Medicare or opting into Medicaid, some states are, are, are experimenting with. Um, it's an interesting procedure because basically what it does is it allows people who can't find plans they like on the exchanges or through their employer to say, you know what, I'm going to pay premiums to Medicare. And it does two things that are interesting. First of all, it, 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 it gives people an option, a public option. And second of all, it says to all the kind of half-baked kind of crappy commercial plans out there, you have to be at least as good as Medicare or people are going to desert you in droves. And the thing is, to have price controls, to have big negotiating power, you don't really have to have a full single-payer single, single payer plan. I mean, Medicare is such a huge insurer, as is Medicaid in the States, that they do have negotiating power if they want to use it. Um, so, you know, for example, with, with uh, prescription drugs, if Medicare was allowed to negotiate pricing, my bet is very quickly a whole bunch of insurers would say, okay, we'll pay, we'll pay what Medicare plays, pays plus 10% or something like that. So at least you have a somewhat rational yardstick by which, which we could judge prices, which is what we totally lack now. So would it be perfect? No, but I think we're, we're, we're now at the phase of, of our dysfunctional health system where we're looking for perfect where like, hey, we're spending 19% of our GDP. Let's just get it down to 17 percent you know we're not aiming for 12 percent like france we're just we're just aiming to turn this this ship around uh elizabeth rosenthal the book is an american sickness how Healthcare became big business and how you can take it back we didn't get into sort of like almost like the the uh the, the sort of the nuts and bolts things that people can do uh today when they're faced with um uh, these prices um that are um 
but a very uh, sort of a practical guide as well as sort of the big picture. So um, uh, we will. Well, I'm happy to come talk about that because I think there's lots people can do and should do because um, we as patients, we the patients are not sending signals to the system if we just write the checks and say, oh, you know, what can I do? You can do stuff. Well, we will put a link to that book at uh, majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you.